And so with all those cerebral attributes, what risks do you take when handing your thinking over to those machines, AI and all that, again? Well, this was nicely debated at Beaker Street, the festival in Hobart. And here we recall the part played by Leela Landowski in a debate chaired by Natasha Mitchell for Big Ideas on RN. Will AI shrink your noddle in any drastic way? Tash. For the affirmative team, Barbie and the Meat Puppets, arguing AI will render human creativity worthless, Dr Leela Landowski is a neuroscientist and lecturer at the University of Tasmania, director of the Australian Society for Medical Research, no less, director of Epilepsy Tasmania, a passionate science communicator. She's been a superstar of STEM, a patron of science, a public education ambassador for the Department of Education and one of Australia's chief scientists Science superheroes. Welcome, Leela. All right, so I'd like to do a little experiment. Close your eyes. I want you to think about the future that James was telling you about. Anything you want, if you know how to ask for it, you've got it. Your own custom music, movies with George Clooney at every lead. In your job, all the tricky things like problem solving, anomaly detection, idea generation, you've got AI to sort that out. And when you go home, you get AI to generate the perfect recipe from all the four and a half to five star recipes. And it's just so good, I think you can hear angels sing. And in this new world, so long as you know how to ask the right questions, you can get AI to create anything that you need. We're not creators anymore, we're curators. You can open your eyes now. So the brain is a remarkable thing, right? It's the overlord of our meat puppet bodies and it's all about efficiency. So when you learn how to do things, you know, the learning a skill, you're actually making brand new connections between parts of the brain and that takes a lot of energy. It requires lots of little proteins to be made. You know, it's a big job, it's tiring. And it's because learning is really expensive, as far as the brain is concerned, it means the brain is not going to bother investing time in reinforcing these things that you've started to outsource to AI. If you're not using it, you're losing it. And I think even more scarily, for the next generation, if you never need it, you never develop it. So let me give you an example of this. Calculators. If I was to ask you to do seven times eight divided by two plus 11, okay, yeah. What about typing a paragraph without using autocorrect? It's ducking heart. <laughs> <laughs> now picture this. So we're coming to you live with the breaking news about a series of extreme weather events. that are currently underway across the country. We're seeing reports of floods in the north and things in the south, and it's bad, and the Bureau says, oh, warnings, advisories, <laughs> Ah, so basically, what's happened, thanks to extreme weather events and climate change, the internet's down, half the world is washed away, power's gone. So without being able to Google anything, how do you rebuild the world from first principles, right? You know, the danger of us becoming increasingly niche in our expertise, thanks to AI, is that we lose our more generalist knowledge. If we know how to find it, we don't have to remember it. And that, my friends, is why I'm nervous about AI and human creativity. Divergent thinking is one of humanity's most celebrated skills. It's just about as high order as it gets. You know, creativity and abstract thought brought us the eureka moments. The Leonardo da Vinci's, the Ada Lovelace's. And my friends, while AI can be more creative than most of us could ever be, relying on it is like having a personal trainer lift the weights for you, right? There are untold personal and societal costs of failing to exercise your creativity. And let's not underestimate them. Leela, did you enjoy that wonderful Beaker Street event? Oh, it was wild. And it really made us think about how AI is going to change the future, not just the future of technology, but the future of us. How much did you agree with the opposition saying it was all great? Well, none of it. I mean, there are definitely some strengths to it. I mean, we're looking at what it can do for science. So, you know, I'm in the medical research field. We can see that the kind of research that is able to be done is just absolutely supercharged. 
just before AI came out, we knew that certain types of data collection would take us, you know, maybe a month to do. Back when I was doing that research, it was taking us maybe four or five years to actually accumulate that data and analyse it. So it's just phenomenal to think about the potential that AI can give us in that field. When we're thinking about, for example, the way that it can improve diagnostics, it's going to improve our ability to find new drug targets, our ability to find potential treatments that can bind those drug targets and do all of that in a way that we haven't been able to do before and really expedite that process. So I'm really excited about that. But I think I'm also a little bit nervous, as I think we hinted from our conversation and debate. As soon as we as humans outsource these skills, well, then especially things like creativity and problem solving, these are the things that are the absolute pinnacle of human ability, right? And in the long term, we're going to potentially impair our ability to do those things, to cultivate those skills. And I think maybe even worse still, maybe we won't even develop those skills to begin with over many generations. But uh, what you were saying about the ways in which the grunt work could be done by AI reminded me of the shape of proteins, which are incredibly complex. Mm. And one of my heroes, heroines, if you like, Francis Arnold, who got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, working out which proteins in the future, which enzymes, obviously, as well, are going to be with us and how you can predict what diseases are going to come. Mm. That sort of thing is obviously the kind of grunt work that AI could do, but it's up to the scientists like Francis Arnold with their Nobel Prize Mm -hmm. to select which is more likely. Right. And the ability that it can sort of predict the way certain proteins are going to fold and potentially interact with these receptors, this would take people many, 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 many years and it would still be a prediction. Like AI can do that in seconds. So it's something that we haven't been able to hope would ever happen. However, when it comes to brain power today, yet again... As we speak, there are surveys being released showing the performance now, especially public schools. They've gone down again. In other words, all the kids that we see walking down the street, all with phones in their hands, should be doing better if they're living in the wonderful extra brain power that AI might provide. Yet something's going wrong. Do you think it could be too much looking at screens? Yeah, well, there's certainly some growing evidence suggesting that time spent looking at screens, particularly this idea of context switching that happens when we use social media. So looking at completely unrelated bits of information. So you're scrolling and you're looking at a bit of news. It's a cat story. It's a birthday. Someone's done something. And when we see 20 different bits of unrelated information in one minute, as opposed to we might see that over an hour or many hours, that actually erodes our attention spans. So studies have demonstrated that this causes a significantly measurable attention deficit. And so based on that alone, it really makes me worry about the impact of technology on the next generation. When she was asked, Dr Cathy Foley, who's the chief scientist, of course, federally, she said, well, one thing they can do, obviously you can ask an AI particular brand of thing to write an essay for you. So what you might do instead is ask two or maybe three different brands to write. And then your exercise is to compare them, see where one of them is doing better than another. Mm -hmm. So you're doing something with your critical faculties. I think that's a really clever and interesting concept. I guess it also requires this requisite knowledge and understanding of how language works and building up our grammar skills. But I guess it's just using it in a different way. And I really like that idea. Can we afford AI? Because the amount of computer power it's using is so huge that in some instances, for instance, when it's being used for banking, they have to keep it under the ice flows to keep it cold. Otherwise, it boils and the computers break. Yeah, I guess the impact of AI on climate is a huge thing that we need to be aware of. Rather than just thinking about the fact that AI takes such a huge amount of power that it is potentially going to impact not just our production of CO2, but also potentially power prices in general. When we look at the amount of energy spent when you put in a particular query into an AI program, it produces about five times as much CO2 than if you were to type it into Google. So there's already a big difference in that space. When we look at the amount of energy it took to create these particular programs, these tools, Estimates suggest that it's almost 23,000 trees in order to sink the carbon that was put into making this technology. And then as we continue to use it, it's creating even more CO2. So there's this unanticipated impact that we really need to consider as well.
A question out of the blue. Having had a couple of science shows just now on Jack Eccles, mind, body, separate things, or the brain doing one whole thing, do you think we're getting close to understanding consciousness? Oh, look, I think we're always getting closer, but I think the more we know, the more we realise we don't understand. And I think there's also this idea that we like to think that we as humans are unique. And this is one of the thoughts that was talked about by Professor Barbara Holland in the debate. And, you know, when you look at it, we love to think that we're these unique beings. But when you bring it down to the science, science shows that our DNA is not that different from chimps. A lot of our behaviours are not that different from other animals as well. Dolphins have language. Birds like crows can make tools and solve problems. And everywhere across the animal kingdom, everyone is having not just procreational sex, but recreational sex and with both sexes. Okay. So there are so many things that we realise we're not unique. And a lot of these things like we have this ability to see patterns in things, but also computers can see patterns in things, right? And that's one thing that our AI really takes hold on. And one of the things that James Riggle was talking about on our side of the debate was about how AI can essentially just take all this data in, remix it, find the patterns of what makes us creative, and then just spit it out in a different way. And that's why we can make music that sounds like Nirvana's unreleased album or make a picture that looks like Monet or one of the great artists. I guess the other thing that we need to consider there is that there's also this potential intellectual property concern, right? You know, AI is taking all these ideas and it's remixing them in this way that we see to be unique, but it's still borrowing ideas. So what kind of intellectual property component do we need to think about with that information? And not only that, this is just the baby form of AI, right? Who knows what it's going to look like when our baby AI fully grows up into its human form, grown up version of AI. I can't even comprehend what that's going to look like. Well, I think R2-D2 is conscious <laughs> and <laughs> I think you are, you are unique. Thank you very much, Lila. Thank you very much. Yes, and given the brain research leadership, Lila Lendowski has shown it's no surprise that she was a finalist in one of our top Eureka Awards this year. She's based in Hobart, and you can hear the Big Ideas AI Brains debate from Beaker Street with Natasha Mitchell by looking online.